Welcome today, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Be back here again in uh, in Denver, and uh, here this ninth Sunday after Pentecost, the epistle is taken from St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians, chapter ten. Brethren, let us not covet. Let us not covet evil things, as they also coveted. Neither be neither become ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed fornication. And there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted Christ, and perished by the serpents. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. No, these things happen to them in figure, and they are written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed, lest he fall. Let no temptation take hold on you, but what such as is human. And God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make also with temptation uh, an issue that you may be able to bear it. And then the Gospel. Take that according to St. Luke, chapter 19. At that time when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known and that in this thy day the things that are for thy peace. But now they are hidden from thy eyes, for the days shall come upon thee, and and thy enemies shall, shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about upon and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that, that sold therein, and they that brought and bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus are the words of today's holy God. Father, only goes to men. A few considerations taken in part from consideration of our one of our new deacons who was ordained a deacon two days ago and preaches for a sermon earlier today. And uh, so that uh, and that consideration simply on one verse of the Holy Gospel. The shortest verse in the sacred scripture, and Jesus wept. To consideration of these words, taken in part from St. Augustine, we consider the weeping of our Lord. There are three weepings that he has. One of them is in the gospel today. And Jesus wept. There are three times that he wept. And one of the times that he wept was today over the city of Jerusalem. He wept over a city. And the next time that he would weep, or the time just before that actually, he just wept right before it, he wept over the death of Lazarus. And the first time we hear the weeping of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is over the death of Lazarus, shortly before he goes into Jerusalem. And when he weeps, what happens? The Holy Ghost inspired, actually, the Jews to say these words. Because our Lord Jesus Christ came, and he walked over to the tomb, and he said, Where is Lazarus? My brother would not have died if thou hadst been here. And he said, Where have you laid him? Where is he? And they brought and showed him the place where Lazarus was. And he wept. The first time we have the weeping of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wept over the death of Lazarus. 
He wept over an individual soul. Now, what is the cause of weeping? St. Thomas will tell us what the cause of weeping is. And Lord Jesus Christ has the greatest weeping, and he wept over the death of Lazarus. And what happened? The people said, see how he loved him. See how he loved him. The cause of tears is love. And one of the greatest gifts that God gives to souls is the gift of tears. It is called the great gift of the supernatural life, the gift of tears. And these tears, they come from our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And notice the tears of our Lord at what they are directed. When God spoke about these human beings that he made, these creatures that decided to eat the forbidden fruit, these creatures that decide to make false religions, these creatures that decide to spit upon him by all of our sins, these creatures born in sin, living in sin, and dying in sin, what did our Lord Jesus Christ say about these creatures who would nail him to a cross? My delight is to be with the sons of men. Notice when he said those sacred words, he said what his delight is. But is it the delight of the sons? Most of the sons, it is not the delight for our master to be with us. And for most of us, we don't delight at all when our master comes, when our creator comes, when God comes. We do not delight. Why does our Lord delight? We only delight in the object of our love. If you love something, you delight in it. You love ice cream, you delight when it shows up. You love Brussels sprouts, you delight when that shows up. But since most people don't love Brussels sprouts, there's not much delight. And it's very understandable to not love Brussels sprouts. But the fact is, delight is caused by love. And it is our Lord Jesus Christ, my delight is to be with the sons of men, and he delights to be with us. Love has so many expressions. Love has so many sounds, there's so many words, but the most sacred form of love is manifested not by words, nor by sounds, but simply by a sacred washing, which we call tears. You know that without tears, God made us in such a way that the most sacred part of our body is our eyes. Our eyes are able to see on one condition that we have tears. If tears are taken from us, then we will, our eyes will dry, they will crack, and we will not be able to see. Tears we often associate since Adam decided to eat that apple, and since Eve decided to be malicious and cause Adam to sin, and since so much death has entered the world, we often think of tears in the wrong way. Notice what our Lord says, be sorry for your sins, and this causes tears. But the greatest of all sorrow that had the greatest amount of tears was the sorrow of him who was the first pope. The sorrow of him who, when he denied Christ three times, he went out and he wept bitterly at the cock crow on the day that he denied Christ. And for the next 31 years, he denied Christ in the year 33 AD. He died in the year 64 AD. And 365 days of every single year, don't forget leap year, 366 during those years. <laughs> every single one of those days, without any exception, Peter went out at 3 o'clock in the morning at the cock crow, and he wept bitterly. What were in the tears of Peter? Those tears are the love that flows from the eyes. And St. Peter had the eyes that could see the faith deeper than anyone else. Every single priest, when he celebrates the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, he holds the creator of the universe between his thumb and his forefinger. And he sees. What did Peter see? These tears caused tears in his life, and he had tears every single day for thousands of days until the day of his death. What was the cause of these tears? 
For Peter, it was only one thing, and that is love. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ, he loved Lazarus. St. Augustine tells us Lazarus, he was a good man. He was a friend of Christ. But God allowed him to be dead in the tomb for four days. And he did not stand for a good man, but he stand for the most wicked of sinners, who was not only a sinner, but he was buried in sin, so much so that his sister that loved him very much spoke divine words inspired by the Holy Ghost. When our Lord said, Where have you laid Lazarus? Lazarus, come forth. And the wise Martha said, Lord, he stinketh. Now why does he stink? He is rotted in sin. He is decaying. He is, his whole being is decayed. He is so far gone. He is like the world of the year 2020. We are at the end of Christianity. We are at the end of Christendom. It is gone. Behold, it stinketh. Behold, it rots. Behold, it is so decayed that we cannot recognize it at all. Where is Christianity in our country? It is gone. Where is it in Europe? It is gone. Where is it in Rome? Gone and decayed. It is so dead that so many souls have the wisdom of Martha. What did our Lord say about Martha? Martha, Martha, thou art solicitous about many things. You worry about many things, Martha. You worry about your sister, Mary Magdalene. She never worked when she was a kid. She grew up a brat. She went out and became a prostitute. She never lifted a finger in her life. And now she got saved. And now she's forgiven. How has she changed? She's not lifting her finger. She's sitting with the men. She's there listening to our Lord. How holy Mary is. And Martha was ticked off. <laughs> she was very solicitous. But Martha was not a fool. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Martha, Martha, thou art solicitous about many things. You have not known tears as this woman has. You have lifted your fingers so many times. You have served me many much food. You have worked hard all your life, and you will be a great saint. But you don't have tears. This woman has loved much. This woman has had tears. The deepest tears that can ever be had where she wept upon my feet. And she, with her hair, wiped away the tears. And these tears are the tears of perfect love. And perfect love has chosen the better part. Therefore, Martha, Martha, you are solicitous about many things. So solicitous about so many things. But she has chosen the better part. Therefore, she sat at the feet of our Lord. And Martha understood. She never complained about Mary Magdalene ever again. And she saw into Mary Magdalene and said, yes, she is. She was worse than I. But she is so much better than I. She is higher than I. She will climb in a higher place in heaven than I. She'll be closer to our Lord than I. And I don't have a problem with that. I will continue to do my work of taking care of tables. I'll continue to do my work of my material work. And I will not allow Mar Mary Magdalene to be taken from the better part. And if anyone tries to take her from it, she's going to have to go through me. Try to make Mary Magdalene work after that day. You're going to have to deal with Martha. And Martha is not nice. You will not allow her sister to ever, ever go below the lower part to a lower part. Because she understood that Christ spoke wisely and well when he spoke of the value of Martha's, Mary Magdalene's tears. She wept. Our Lord Jesus Christ came, and there is Lazarus, like our holy church, buried and dead. They are wicked bishops, immersed in wickedness and sold their soul to the devil, and belong to the Satanists and belong to the Masons. There are wicked bishops that are in, 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 uh, to live in evil lives, 
who are not necessarily Satanists but live in evil lives. There are wicked priests. There are wicked people. It is a wicked church. It is buried in wickedness. And this church does not have confidence in God. It is dead four days in the tomb. It is buried. And souls today are buried in sin. And they don't want to come back to life. But what happened? Our Lord Jesus Christ says, Show me where you buried him. Show me the place. And Martha showed the place. This is the place where my brother was. And if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died. But he's dead now. No thanks to you showing up late. I'm not complaining, just pointing out a fact. <laughs> and there he is, dead. Very wise, Martha. And Christ wept. And he was not disturbed by Martha's words. Oftentimes we have prayers like that. Does it disturb Christ? Doesn't disturb him at all. Take your complaints to our Lord. Why are you letting these things happen to my family? Why are you letting our church fall apart? How long, O oh Lord, would thou let this disaster go on? How long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, how long? David said these words. And he didn't understand. Does it disturb Christ? No, show me where you have laid this dead man. Show me where that soul that is buried in sin, the most famous of them was the most wicked and most proud Augustine, the most wicked and proud of all. Show me where this man buried in sin is. Show me where his pride is. Show me where he is. And his mother Monica pointed. Said, That's where the most wicked man is. He is my son. And then our Lord wept. Our Lord's tears, they are not useless. But what did the wise Jews say that day? Behold how he loved him. What is it that is happening right now in the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the heart of his Holy Mother? Because as the deacon pointed out earlier today, we go back to La Salette 150 years ago. And the little children went to a mountain in France, and they saw a woman, a mother, weeping most bitterly with her hands in her face, her face in her hands. And she was the mother of God, weeping for a dead Christianity, weeping for a dead church, weeping for dead priests and dead bishops, weeping for dead popes, dead in their hearts, dead in their souls. Weeping for the wickedness of our age. Now what is the cause of this weeping? Here we must understand. Love is the cause of tears. A man comes in. And he takes $10,000 out of my safe. I weep. Why do I weep? Because I love the guy. <laughs> Maybe not. I'd love to see him dead, maybe. <laughs> Why do I weep? Because I love that 10000 I had plans to buy three Starbucks with that. I had plans to make two car payments. I had plans to pay off one thousandth of my debt. I had plans. And this $10,000 is gone. I weep. But there are others that weep. It is love that makes us weep. For what do we weep? And know this about the man Jesus Christ in his human heart. And God the Son in his divine heart. Did he weep because his father was offended? Did he weep because the glory of God was assaulted? Because we spit upon our creator? He did not weep because of that. He wept because he loved Lazarus. He weeps because he loves the man who is immersed in the most perverse sins. He loves the one who is at the bottom of the pit. He loves the one that turns away from God and spits upon him. He weeps because he loves Lazarus. 
He weeps because he loves a sinner. He weeps because of that. And why is he on earth? Because he can express in his human tears, since he has humanity, what God the Father has in his divinity. For God the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Because he loves us. And then he commanded his Son. They don't know what love is. They cannot do justice. One must freely suffer the punishment, and none of them are able to do it. So, son, I got a job for you. I have a work for you. Go to earth and get down there and experience my wrath. Go to earth and die for the sake of these souls that I love. And Christ came down from heaven to earth, and he loved the same souls. And the Holy Ghost brought him down to this earth by the Blessed Virgin Mary because he loved the same souls. What do we love? A man steals $10,000 from my case. I can weep. One reason to weep is because I love him. And I hate to see what that money is doing to his soul, how it is destroying him. I hate to see the death that's going to come that is inside of his heart. I hate to see the judgment that God has in store for him if he does not repent. And I don't want him to go to that judgment, and therefore we weep. And God instructed the priests to learn this kind of weeping. When he said in the Ancient Testament and the Old Testament, the priest must weep for the sins of the people between the porch and the altar. This is one reason why at the beginning of the Mass, we have the two confidiars. In the first confidiar, the priest bows over and says, I am sorry for my sins because I, a priest of God, am human flesh and I'm a sinner. And I confess to all that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. And my brothers pray for me. Then he rises up and he hears your confession. And during this time, his heart is supposed to weep between the porch and the altar. And Christ will look down upon the weeping of the priest, because the salvation of souls depends upon the weeping of the priest. Unless our Lord Jesus Christ came down and wept, consider those tears, for many man has cried because of love, of the loss of a loved one. But can anyone imagine the depth of the tears of our Lord Jesus Christ when Lazarus was dead four days in a tomb? They are most sacred tears. And the tears made him rise up and say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus did come forth because of the tears of Christ. And every single time you hear the words, Ego te absolvo apocates tuis. Every time you hear the priest of God, who speaks these words only in the name of Christ. And Christ speaks these words, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And what happens? The love of the tears of Jesus Christ goes into that soul and wipes out perfectly clean all the sins and throws them out and makes the soul clean. These are the tears of the first type. The tears over a soul. But then there are the second tears. And these are the tears of the gospel today. Our Lord Jesus Christ walked up to the city of the top of Mount Olivet. He looked down upon Jerusalem the day that he would walk in and be received in glory. And he wept. He wept over the city. And here we are to remember, our Lord Jesus Christ loved that city. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered you under my wing? Like the mother hen gathers her chicks, but thou wouldest not. How many times would I have brought you in? But thou wouldest not, thou wouldest not. And he wept over Jerusalem. Now remember this, what happened when Jesus Christ cried over Lazarus? He remained rotten for four days, but he came forth out of the tomb. What will happen when our Lord Jesus Christ weeps over Jerusalem? And he says, Jerusalem, you will be destroyed. And Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. And the temple will be destroyed. But what is going to happen after that destruction? Behold, the people of God, of the Old Testament, whom we call the Jews, they shall rot. 
for four days. But then at the end, what shall happen? They shall rise. The tears of Christ are always fruitful. The tears of Christ always bring their victory. And he cries over the city. These people that said, Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. One day they shall repent as a people, not just as individuals, as many have repented and become saints over the last 2,000 years. But as a people, as Jerusalem, as the people of God, they will repent. And there shall be a new glory of the Jews in the last days, and they shall stand up against the Antichrist, and they shall be the main part of the army that defeats the Antichrist. Because they shall repent. And this is part of our, our religion and part of our gospel. And we celebrate it in every single Mass. At every Mass, we begin the Mass with a book on the Epistle side. That is, we begin with the side of the Jews. And we light the candle upon that side. And at the very end of Mass, we will extinguish the candle on the Gospel side. Because one day the light will go out from the Gentiles. And the light will go back to the Jews. And they shall repent, because Christ's tears shall always be effective. And the city of Jerusalem shall be conquered. It shall repent, it shall be rebuilt, and there shall be a new Jerusalem. And then there are the third tears. These are also the tears of today. And these are the tears that drive sin completely away from the earth. These are the tears that Christ sheds upon the damned. They are the tears primarily considered in the gospel today. For Christ wept over Judas, and Christ wept over Jerusalem of old, and Christ wept over all the false civilizations that turned against him, and Christ wept over every sinner. He shed his blood not only for those that are saved, but he also shed his blood for those that have rejected him and are damned. And these are the tears of love. He loved the Antichrist with the fullness of love, but the Antichrist shall reject him. He loved Judas, but Judas was better that he was not born. He loved all of the wicked souls of all age, and he poured his tears out of love for them. But they rejected that love, usque ad martem. They rejected that love unto a death. And therefore the tears shall push them down and make them crushed in the center of the earth. And the tears shall crush them in the middle of the earth, and the tears shall turn into the greatest heat and shall become fire. The breath of the Lord is a torrent of fire, saith the sacred scripture. It is the tears of God that make this holy fire and make it burn upon the damned. And since his love is infinite, the rejection of his love is also infinite. If only thou hadst known the things that were for thy peace, but thou didst not know. Why is there trouble in the world? Because America does not know, love, and serve God. Why is there trouble in the entire world? Because the entire world does not know, love, and serve God. And if the world knows, loves, and serves God in its laws, in its uh, public and individual and private life, in every place, then there is peace in this world. But if we turn away from that, there is trouble. And hence there is sorrow all around us. And Christ weeps. And many of these rotten sinners, they shall be touched by the tears of Christ and rise from the dead. But those that refuse to rise... Lazarus, come forth. Notice when Christ said that, Lazarus had to get up on his own. Lazarus had to walk on his own outside of the tomb, and they had to unravel the linen cloth by which he was buried. So Christ gives the grace for everyone to be saved, but he will not force anyone to be saved. If we reject his tears, and reject them most way ad martem, all the way to death, then the tears shall crush the souls into the fires of hell, and they shall burn. Therefore we must know what are the days of the peace. And the final weeping and weeping of Christ was when he wept by blood, and all three weepings happened again during the three hours of the agony in the garden. But in any case, remember what is the cause of the weeping of Christ? His love of us. 
Now, what is this weeping supposed to cause? If he has suffered so much and done so much because of the love of me individually, the love of me personally, you consecrated a bishop a few days ago, the final profession of faith was, we began, but do you believe in the Blessed Trinity? Do you, Joseph Pfeiffer, believe in the Blessed Trinity? Do you believe in all the things of the church? Do you believe all the church has taught and so on? And the final one was, do you, Joseph Pfeiffer, elect bishop, do you believe that your body, your physical body that carries you right now, shall rise from the dead and stand before God? Do you believe that you, Personally, that I personally, this body right here that stands before you, do I believe that this body shall not die and remain corrupted forever, but it shall be carried up before my judge, and it shall stand before him in judgment, and it shall be physically there on the last day. Do you believe this? Credo. And that is the final test. Do I believe? That the gospel that is entrusted to me as a priest of God must be in my flesh. Do I believe the truth is here in my skin and in my blood? Do I believe that when it is torn apart and when it is ripped to pieces and when it is brought to death that it shall not remain separated? I believe the examination is complete. It is not enough to believe in catechism words that are found in a book. They must enter into our flesh. They must enter into our being and be carried by our feet. They must be carried by our hands. They must be carried by our hearts to the very ends of the earth. Now, what made it possible to have this belief? The tears of our Lord Jesus Christ when he wept over Lazarus. And when he wept over the city of Jerusalem. And when he did the triple weeping that took place on Holy Thursday, uh, Good Friday, uh, Holy Thursday night in the agony of the garden. And after he rose from his weeping, he went to war. The bloody tears filled his entire body. And these bloody tears made him stronger than any exercise program, made him much more powerful against the devil than any weapon the devil had ever faced. And in blood tears, he went to battle. In total exhaustion, he went to fight Satan. And he defeated the kingdom of hell by the power of the love that produces tears. Let's pray for that love to enter our hearts. Pray for it to be carried to this world again. And may the tears of the Lady of La Salette now bear their fruit. Soon her tears shall have their fruit, and there shall be a resurrection of the Holy Church. It shall return to its glory. It shall not be held back. Let us have confidence in tears. In tears that are because of the love of someone else. And the Lord has shown so many tears upon me, and so many tears upon each one of us. So many infinite, can we not shed one tear for love of him? This tear is enough to wipe away all the horrors and ugliness of the decayed and dead modern world. May these tears come soon. Who does you all?